The Author's Shelf. The Author's Shelf. The Author's Shelf. The Author's Shelf. It's about books and stuff. <laughs> Good afternoon, I'm Georgie Donahay and welcome to another edition of The Author's Shelf. That was a little bit of fairy dust there. We have a fairy tale show today. I'm very excited to have author Kate Forsyth join me on today's show. Kate is the author of many award-winning titles such as her historical novels, Bitter Greens and The Wild Girl. Books for children such as The Stark and Crown, The Puzzle Ring and the picture book Grumpy Grandpa. Her new book, Two Selkie Stories from Scotland, is already creating a buzz in the writing world. So sit back and relax as I bring you the stories beyond the page. You're listening to The Author's Shelf on 2SSR 99.7 FM, Sound of the Sutherland Shire. Coming up next, Kate Forsyth. Welcome back. It's time to introduce today's guest. Now, when I Googled Kate Forsyth, my search returned a staggering 5 million results. Here's a little bit I discovered about this wonderful lady. Kate Forsyth was born Kate Humphrey and has been published under both her maiden and married names. She wrote her first novel at the age of seven and is now the internationally best-selling and award-winning author of over 30 books, ranging from picture books, poetry to poetry to novels for both adults and children. Kate was recently voted one of Australia's favourite uh, Australia's favourite 20 novelists and has been called one of the finest writers of this generation. That's a very nice title to have. She's also an accredited master storyteller with the Australian Guild of Storytellers and has told stories to both children and adults all over the world. Kate's books have been published in 14 countries around the world, including the UK, the US, Russia, Germany and Japan. And she is currently undertaking a doctorate in fairy tale retellings at the University of Technology, having already completed a BA, Bachelor of Arts in Literature and an MA in Creative Writing. Kate is a direct descendant of Charlotte Atkinson, the author of the first book for children ever published in Australia called A Mother's Offering to Her Children. Kate Forsyth, welcome to The Author's Shelf. Hello, Georgie. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to have you, Kate. Now, Kate, I always begin by asking my guests what is their story, so please tell us what is the Kate Forsyth story. Oh, well, what a big question. (laughs) Um, I was born here in Sydney and I've lived here all of my life. I've always wanted to be a writer. I've never wanted to do anything else. None of this wanting to be a ballerina or an astronaut. No, for me, it was always about writing. Um, I've always written. You know, my mum says I began as soon as I could first hold a pencil. And I wrote my first novel when I was only seven. And I've pretty much been writing one ever since then. Um, All through my teens and my early 20s, the big challenge for me was, you know, to get published and to be able to make my living from my writing. And so I feel like I'm one of these really lucky people because all my dreams have come true. Oh, that is a fairy tale story, it is. Kate. <laughs> now, you've published under both your maiden and married names. You were, mm-hmm. you were the one time president of the Poets Union and published under your maiden name, Kate Humphrey. Did you begin publishing under your maiden name? And- well, yes, because I, I began to be published when I was only um, in my late teens, early 20s. And so I had poems published and I worked as a journalist. And so I had a lot of articles published under my maiden name, Kate Humphrey. Right. And I, um, I kept on being published all the way up until my first novel was published. And that was coincidentally published the same year that I got married. And my first novel was a book called Dragon Claw. And it was a, a fantasy um, novel which drew upon Scottish history and Scottish folklore. And my publisher said to me, she said, you know what, Kate, I have to say, your married name is such a good writer's name. Why don't we publish it under Kate Forsyth? And then we've got that kind of Scottish link going on. I went, okay. (laughs) I I liked my married name more than my my maiden name because I got teased so much for being a a Humphrey K. Bear when I was a little girl. Oh, okay. (laughs) So I... um, I, uh, my first novel was, uh, I signed the contract, Kate Humphrey, publishing as Kate Forsyth. But then, um, coincidentally, about 10 years later, I published the book that I had written as my master's, um, as my thesis for my master's degree. And the same publisher said to me, oh, Kate, maybe we should publish it under Kate Humphrey to separate it from your fantasy work. And I went, oh, okay. <laughs> If you think that's a good idea. And so I signed that contract as Kate Forsyth, writing as Kate Humphrey. 
apparently, as I said, very very exciting. And you, you're not very hard to convince, there, Kate. I mean, you chop and change your name. You're happy to do that. Uh, no, well, you see, I, um, it, what is really interesting about that is that the book that was published as Kate Humphrey is being republished this year under the name Kate Forsyth. Oh, okay. And so the only title of mine which was ever published as, um, as Kate Humphrey is now being published under Kate you know, Kate Forsyth, because what we found is that, um, you know, the fear was that readers wouldn't follow me from genre to genre and from age group to age group. But what we have found is that they actually do. Children who read my children's books have grown up and now read my adult books, and my adult readers read my children's books. And readers who knew me because of my of my poetry and my and my journalism have read my fiction, and and vice versa. And so. Um, I think the accepted wisdom, you know, 15 odd years ago was that you should have a different name for every genre of fiction that you worked under. But I think now it's this um, sense that the name has, a, you know, like the, the name of the writer has a certain power and a certain recognition and people are more likely to buy it because of the name. Right. You know, that, I mean, it was, it was quite simply, you know, that was what I was advised to do. So that's what I did. Okay. But with We've changed our minds now. Okay. Well, we love you no matter what. And with the internet, we can find you anyway, so you can't hide anymore. I know. <laughs> now tell me, what do you love about being an author? Oh, oh Georgie, I love everything about being an author. Um, I love the daydreaming mm -hmm. and the fact that I can stare out a window and tell people that I'm working. <laughs> I love the fact like there's nothing more exciting to me than going and buying a new notebook because I'm about to start a new novel and I actually search out and try and find the best and most beautiful notebook because that's how I work. I, I, I actually work longhand into my notebook first. And when I, you know, when I find that workshop, that, that, you know, that all those empty pages, that all those infinite possibilities, and then I begin to write and then the story comes to life in my imagination. That is so thrilling and so exciting. And then I, I actually do love the, like the labour, like, you know, the long, hard work of it. Yes. Um, I can't think of any better way to spend my time than actually sitting down and knuckling down and getting those words down on the page. And then I love, I love finishing my first draft. That's incredibly exciting. But then I know that, you know, there's all this hard work ahead of me and I love editing and turning that kind of rough diamond. I love cutting it and polishing it and turning it into something that really sparkles. And then, of course, to get your book, to open my front door and find a box of books and open it up, and there it is. My baby is being published and going out into the world. What's not to love? That's oh, you, You're going to turn people who, who are non-writing people, non-authors, you're going to turn them into writers, Kate. Oh, I hope so. Now, okay, how, how, you've got your baby. Your baby's arrived in the mm -hmm. box at the front door. You've opened it. What? How do you celebrate oh. when it's all ready to go out into the world? How do you celebrate? Well, I'm a bit of a sparkly girl. <laughs> I love my sparkling wine. We'll open a bottle of champagne, usually, maybe two. <laughs> it's always it's always a wonderful day, I have to say. And then it's really exciting when you go out and you see your books on the shelves in the bookshops. Yes, I imagine it would be very mm. exciting. Now, who are your favourite authors, Kate? Well, I have so many favourite authors that this is actually my, my least favourite question. Thank you, Georgie. Okay. <laughs> but um, I have been a voracious reader ever since um, I was a little girl, and I think that my own imagination has been greatly shaped by the books that I read. As an adult, my favourite authors, um, you know, for example, I love Geraldine Brooks and The Year of Wonders, Kate Morton, Marcus Zusak. I love writers like Tracy Chevalier and Joanne Harris. Um, I, I really love them because they are like me in, in that every book that they write is very different from any other book that they've written, which means that there's always a surprise. And I really like that. Um, I love um, children's writers like Philip Pullman and um, Neil Gaiman, Dana Wynne Jones. Oh, I could just keep on listing names for the next two hours and not come to the end of my favourite writers. Well, how about I give you a little tip? Yeah. I had uh, Bill Condon and Diane Bates on the show recently, and I think it was Bill who said when I asked him, what book would he take to a desert island with him? I think it was Bill who said he'd take an entire library. <laughs> so there you go. You can sum it up just like that. You can put all your authors in the library. You take the library with you and you've got them all right at your hand right then and there. How's that? That sounds like 
heaven to me. All right. Would there be a bottle of it to bring me a cocktail? What I drank through, what I drank through, what I read my way through my library because then that would be my perfect holiday. I think, I think yes, I think we could organise your butler. No worries there. Oh, Georgie, thank you, darling. <laughs> All right. Now, you're the ambassador for Room to Read and the Pajama Foundation. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your role with these two organisations. Oh, um, certainly. Well, um, both Room to Read and and the Pajama Foundation um, are charities that work um, to, uh, you know, raise literacy and to help underprivileged children. Uh, the Pajama Foundation is um, is based in Brisbane, and what they, you know, basically what they do is they have ambassadors or, or they have um, volunteers that go out to children who are at risk and just read a story to them every night when the children are in there in their pajamas. So that child every day has. An hour or so where they're safe and 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 warm and cozy, and they have someone reading them a story. And I mean, I'm I'm sure that we all can understand how precious that would be to a child who's having a very difficult home life. Absolutely. Um, I have to say that I quite often do um, appearances uh, for the Pajama Foundation, and the last one I did, which was at the Brisbane Writers Festival last year, we had to be on stage in our pajamas. I was going to ask about that. Yes, and see, I was on stage with Nick Earl and with um, Andrew Griffiths, and I mean, it's fine for a man to turn, you know, to kind of wander around the festival with ten thousand people dressed in their pajamas. Not so easy for me. No, ladies feel a little bit more uncomfortable walking around in in public in their pajamas. That's exactly right, you know. So, but I I did it anyway because I'm a on. very brave and committed woman. Very Room good. to read is. Um, a completely different type of organisation. It's much more international, um, and their aim is to um, build libraries in places like, you know, Nepal. Um, you know, build schools, and they have a particular focus on education for girls, which is something that's very, very close to my own heart. So, um, again, um, you know, the role of being an ambassador is, is simply to talk about them and, and the work they do and I occasionally do appearances for them. I was in Hong Kong recently for the Hong Kong International Literary Festival and I did an appearance for Room to Read there um, and helped them raise some money that was hopefully going to go and buy books for girls in, in India. So it was a wonderful, a wonderful night. That's lovely. Thank you very much for sharing that with us. And you can find out more about Room to Read and the Pajama Foundation on the internet. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. You're listening to The Author's Shelf on 2SSR 99.7 FM. Kate, how long does it take you to write a book? It's not, you know, there's no simple answer to that because every single book is just a completely new and different endeavour. Some books are short and some books are long. I've written a picture book which is taking me an afternoon and I've worked on books that have taken more than 20 years to actually find a publisher. Um, obviously, I wasn't working on on that book for 20 years without doing anything else. But you know, some book, you know, each book, each it's a whole new, new and different creative journey. And the answer is as long as it needs to, to take. In general, though, I have one big book and one small book published a year, so it might be one extremely large adult book and a picture book or it might be um, a, a couple of children's books. So it just really depends on what project I'm working on. Bitter Greens, which is my biggest book, it took me seven years to research and write. But in that time, I had at least three or four books published as well. Right. Now, do you find it easier writing for children or for adults? It's just different. Um, in general, writing for children is easier simply because the books are smaller. Mm. Um, for example, I've just finished um, a series of five children's fantasy adventure books. Each of those books was only 30,000 words long. And so all of those five books together are about the same length as a big book like Bitter Greens or The Wild Girl. Right. But, you know, um, but I had to write five, you know, five complete books, you know, five complete narrative structures as opposed to one. So in a way, it's more challenging. Um, I love, uh, you know, I love writing for both. And my preferred way is to write one big adult book, which is very research intensive and is kind of dark and difficult to write and very challenging. And then I might write a children's series, you know, you know, three books or five books. And then I'll write another big, dark adult book. And that way, I find that um, I don't get too exhausted and I don't get jaded. 
Why do you think why do you think your books are so loved? Oh, um what a lovely question. Well they are. <laughs> <laughs> um Do you know when you're writing a story that you're writing something that is, you know, award winning that people are going to fall in love with? Or do you do you just write the story because you feel you need to tell the story and you need to get it out? Both. Um, I guess is the true answer. I mean the true answer is that I write the story and, and um that that I feel an imperative to tell and I trust implicitly in the story and trust that the story will tell me who you know who I'm writing it for and what I always say the story determines the shape so that the story will tell me what I need to do and so I just trust implicitly in that and tell the best story I possibly can um, I do think that one of the reasons why my books are so popular is because I'm a storyteller and so the you know it's all about telling the best story I possibly can and even though I, I pay a great deal of attention to you know things like you know um, the the poetic intensity of the language and and other factors for me the story is always paramount and so everything else has to be sacrificed to that if there's a particularly beautiful you know description of a sunset but it's really slowing the story down I'll take out the description of the sunset. I might turn it into a poem. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much for that. Kate, thanks for joining me this afternoon on The Author's Shelf. Now, on my last show, Adam Wallace and I discussed writer's block. Authors have mixed feelings about this term, so we decided to rename it Creatively Challenged. Have you ever found yourself creatively challenged? No, not really. Um, <laughs> I, um, of course, in every single every single book there are times when I don't feel like writing um, because or I have got too much else to do but I always write anyway um, and there are times when I, I am stuck and can't move forward in the story but that's normally because I, I don't know the story well enough yet and so I have to ha have a period of time thinking and daydreaming and asking myself questions and answering those questions. I normally find that um, if I approach my day's work with a, a a feeling of joyful anticipation, then the work comes to me very easily. And it's when I come into my office not really feeling like working that it comes in a more slow and arduous way. And so generally I, I, I always try and, and bring myself to that stage where I'm looking forward to the day's work and I have I know what I see it in my mind's eye and so all I have to do is write what I see. All right. How about you tell us what's your typical writing day? Um, well, I have three children, um, so both my boys are teenagers and, and at high school, so they're up and out fairly early in the morning. So I have a leisurely breakfast with my daughter, get as much of the household chores done as I can, and then take her to school. I walk for about an hour, and then I come back and I, I work through until the evening. My husband also works from home, so he he normally makes me lunch, which is very nice. Oh, and that's so, lovely. Yes. And then I work through until all the kids are home, um, home from school. And then I either cook dinner or my husband will cook dinner and we'll help with homework and I might do a few more chores because that's what a mother has to do. Yes. And then um, I do it all again the next day. I, I try and have at least one computer-free day um, a week, which is normally Saturday because that's the day when the kids do most of their sport right. and ballet and things like that. And so I just try not to turn the computer on at all. But I'll always do a little bit of work in my notebook or I'll do some research or some reading. And I, I do the same on Sundays. Okay. So I work every day. Okay. So what, all right, well, why do you think that people are so fascinated with fairy tales? Oh, well, um, I think the fairy tales are fascinating. I've always been fascinated with them as well. I think it's partly to do with the fact that um, they are among the first stories that we hear. And so they, um, you know, they help uh, you know, shape and color our imaginations. I think that it is because, um, you know, fairy tales are, are often about the playing out of some kind of deep psychological drama, some kind of human um, dilemma that that you know we all share, and so I think that you know they have some kind of potent meaning for us. That often that we only sense subconsciously, because you know fairy tales speak to us in the language of the subconscious, in archetype, in metaphor, in image, in symbol. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, we sense that they have meaning, but we don't quite know what that meaning is, and so they are mysterious. I, I mean, I think there are, are many reasons. I think as we grow up and we begin to see some of the dramas of fairy tales played out in our own lives, and we begin to understand how, you know, that there is some kind of old wisdom contained in them. I think that all of us have met an ogre, haven't we? Uh, yes. Yes. Many ogres. Many ogres. So what's your favourite fairy tale? Well, it's again a question I get asked a lot. I have, I have many fairy tales that I love. Um, I think obviously Rapunzel is kind of a very important one to me and that was what drove me to write Bitter Greens. My novel Bitter Greens is a retelling of the Rapunzel fairy tale but it's retold as a historical novel um, you know, set in Renaissance Venice. Um, you know, why is it that it was this particular fairy tale that spoke to me so strongly? I think it has a lot to, to do with the fact that um, I spent a lot of time as a child in hospital. Mm -hmm. And so I was a little girl entrapped in a metaphorical tower. And um, the reason why I was in hospital, because I had um, suffered uh, an accident as a child which had injured my tear duct. And so I was unable to control my own tears. My tears made me very ill. Right. And you may remember that in the end of the Rapunzel fairy tale, the prince, her lover, is flung down from the tower and he falls amongst thorns yes. and he's blinded. And Rapunzel seeks him out and she weeps and her tears fall upon his eyes and heal him. Right. And so I think subconsciously Rapunzel held out the hope to me that I too would one day escape my imprisonment my imprisonment of pain and fever and illness and my imprisonment in the hospital, and that I too would be healed. And of course, you know, I did escape and I was healed. But I think that because I read that fairy tale at a time when I really needed that hope, I think it became extremely symbolically powerful to me. Now, you've touched on Bitter Greens, which we'll talk more about later in the show. Tell us about The Wild Girl. Oh, well, I often find that when I'm, when I'm writing one book, it stirs me up and it, it, it flings up ideas for other books. And this is exactly what happened to me. Um, when I was writing Bitter Greens, I began by researching the history of the, of the Rapunzel fairy tale. Now, I had always thought it was a grim fairy tale, and I'd always thought that the Grimms had, um, had oral sources for their fairy tales. And so I imagined that someone somewhere had once told one of the Grimm uh, um, brothers you know, this tale. Mm. Now, what I actually um, discovered is that a Rapunzel was a literary fairy tale, which means it had been written down much earlier, and the Grimm brothers had simply copied the story out of a book. But I did find that they had a number of oral sources for their tales, and that one of them was this young woman. Her name was Dorchen Wild, and she, if it was German, you'd say Wild. But I call her Wild because because the book's called The Wild Girl. Yes. She grew up next door to the Grimm brothers. Um, there were five Grimm boys and one girl, and there were six wild sisters and one boy. And they grew up next door to each other. And when the Grimm brothers began to collect fairy tales, they found that Dorchen, who was then only 18 years old, had this incredible storehouse of old stories. She told them more than one quarter of all of the tales in their first collection, in their 1812 collection. This young, and she was young and beautiful, and she and Wilhelm Grimm fell madly in love, but she was forbidden to see him. Her father didn't think that he was a good suitor for Dorchen's hand, so she had to sneak out behind her, fa you know, behind her father's mm. back and tell him, so, like she told him, Rumpel Stilt Skin, Hansel and Gretel, Six Swans, um, the Elves and the Shoemaker. You know, she told him some of the world's most famous fairy tales in parks and forests and gardens and in her sister's summer house, anywhere where her father wouldn't know. Such an amazing story. It is an amazing story. And I wanted to write it so badly, but then I, I was I was deep into the research of Bitter Greens, and so I had to put aside the story and wait. And it, it, it took me another six years to finish researching and writing Bitter Greens, and all that time I knew I had this amazing story and I was terribly afraid that someone else was going to write it, but nobody did. I can just I can just see them sitting there, you know, under the sunshine and, and he's totally, you know, captivated by what mm. she's telling him and just, yeah, magical. Thank you for sharing that with us, Kate. That's my pleasure. 
pleasure. Now, it's time for another Author Shelf giveaway. It's time for the Author Shelf giveaway. <laughs> da, da, da. Thank you very much. That's my little Charlotte there. Now, if you'd like to win a copy of Kate's book, Bitter Greens, we have that to give away this week. Please pop over to our Facebook page after the show, Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the author shelf and tell us why you would like to win a copy of Kate's book, Bitter Greens. I'll announce the winner on our next show. If you'd like to interact with us during the show, you can send us a message via Facebook, facebook.com forward slash the author, author shelf or you can tweet us at the author shelf or even after the show, we'd love to hear from you. My guest today on the author's shelf is Kate Forsyth. Kate, you have quite a literary family, going back to your great, 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 great grandmother, Charlotte Atkinson, and also a famous sister and brother. All right, spill the beans, Kate. <laughs> it's true. Um, so my great, 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 great grandmother wrote the first children's book um, published in Australia. It was a book called A Mother's Offering to Her Children by a lady long resident in New South Wales. So it was published anonymously. Um, her story is an utterly extraordinary story. And I, I, I often tell it, um, you know, when I'm storytelling. It's one of the tales that I tell a lot. And I've moved people in my audience to tears telling it. Um, you know, she was, um, you know, the book was published in 1841. She was a widow, a woman alone with four children. And she wrote the book in order to try and make some money to support her children. Um, it, it's an extraordinary part of our literary history and it's amazing it's not better known. Um, the Children's Book Council of Australia do have um, an, a literary award named after her, which is wonderful. Um, her daughter, Louisa Atkinson, who was my great, 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 great aunt, was Australia's first female-born novelist. Um, mm. And again, her story was extraordinary um, and you know, full of triumph and tragedy, as these stories often are. There's been writers, I must admit, um, Charlotte Waring Atkinson's um, grandfather had been a poet, um, Albert Waring, um, an extremely popular Victorian poet that no one has ever heard of nowadays. Um, and there have been writers in nearly every generation of the family, either poets, journalists, academics, or novelists like me and my sister. Uh, Blinda her, is published under Blinda Morell, and you know she's one of Australia's um, you know top selling and best beloved children's authors. My brother publishes under his I about to say his maiden name <laughs> <laughs> under his name Kate um, Nick Humphrey. Most of his books are on law and and business, but um, he's a best selling author as well. How did you find the link? to Charlotte Atkinson? Were you doing your family tree? Or oh, how did no, it we, we always knew. We grew up oh, on it. Oh, okay. You know, when we were little children, we were told her story and we were told the story of how she wrote the book. Um, what was amazing to us is that no, nobody else knew because um, she published anonymously. Right. And in the 70s, um, a... Uh, a librarian and bibliographer called Marcy Muir, she set out to try and find out who was this an anonymous woman who wrote the first children's book published in Australia. And she devoted, oh, you know, years and years, decades to the search and, you know, spent all her own money. And then when she found out who it was and it was published in all the national papers, I can remember I would have been maybe um, nine or ten. And I can remember my grandfather laughing and going, oh, well, if we'd realised they didn't know, they could have asked us any time. <laughs> she spent all that time and all she had to do was come and knock on your front door. I know, but, you know, it was just because up until the 70s, 80s, um, not many people actually studied um, Australian children's literature. And so she had just dropped into obscurity. And so only her her descendants know. Like, we all have this wonderful archive of, you know, um, signed first editions and... Um, you know, second editions of the book. I mean, none of us have a first edition of her book, and the, the National Library has one, and it's it's worth about sixty or seventy thousand dollars. Wow! And when the Children's Book Council of Australia uh, named um, one of their awards after Charlotte, they wanted to um, show the first edition, and they couldn't afford the insurance for the security oh, guards. Gosh. Yeah, I would imagine so. <laughs> So anyway, um, it's it's a wonderful story. My sister Belinda has actually written a novel inspired by the story of how she came to write the book. It's called The River Charm. Right. It's the most wonderful book. So if you want to know about, 
the story behind how Australia's First Children's Book was published, you need to read my sister's book. We Elizabeth actually Charles. have your sister visiting us in a few shows' time, so oh. we, we can definitely chat more about her. I'm with, sure she'll talk about all about the, it then. The River <laughs> Charm. Um, all right. Now, I, I was going to get you to read from Bitter Greens, but I want to keep asking you questions, and we're rapidly running out of time. Oh, ask me questions. So, then. okay, tell us all about your new book, Two Selkie Tales from Scotland. Oh, well, you know, Two Selkie Tales from Scotland just arose out of one of those uh, you know, conversations between friends. A good friend of mine is the author, Sophie Masson. Yes. And um, I was staying with her. She lives up in Armadale, and I had gone up to Armadale to teach at the New England Writers' Centre. And so I stayed with Sophie, and she'd just come back from Russia, and we were having this... You know, one of those conversations where everyone gets really excited, and we were sharing fairy tales, and she was telling me about this new project of hers, um, uh, Two Tricks to Tales from Russia. And I was telling her some of the stories. Um, my grandmother's grandmother, this is um, not Charlotte Waring, but this is who was my grandfather's great-grandmother. But my grandmother's grandmother was Scottish. And when she came to Australia from Scotland in the 1820s, she just brought with her this vast storehouse of amazing Scottish stories, you know, fairy tales and folklore. And I began telling Sophie some of the stories that, I had grown up on. And Sophie got tremendously excited and said, isn't it a shame that none of these tales are being published anymore? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we published them beautifully illustrated? And so that's, it just kind of arose out of that conversation. And so um, she has a publishing house called Christmas Press that had published Two Tricks for Tales from Russia. And so she asked me if I'd write up to Selkie Tales. Like we, we actually talked, because there's so many wonderful, there's, stories about giants and there's stories about queens and, yes. <laughs> you know, um, Scottish fairy tales are extraordinarily rich, but we decided to settle on two Selkie tales. And so I wrote them up and then they've been gorgeously, gorgeously illustrated by Fiona MacDonald. Um, you know, so both of us have a, a Scottish cultural heritage and um, it was just really, really extraordinary. One of the most interesting things about it though is that I had always known this story of the Selkie Bride and that there was a, a, a Scottish clan called the McPhees that were meant to be you know descended from Selkies but it wasn't until I was you know I was writing up my teacher notes for the book that I rang Belinda my sister and Belinda reminded me that our grand our grandmother's great grandmother had been a McPhee so I am descended from Selkies. Oh my goodness! I know, and I had forgotten until I wrote this book. Oh, you know, if if I, I imagine show and tell for you at school must have been absolutely fascinating. <laughs> I was um, I was at the CBCA um, uh, event recently and told a story from my childhood, and um, a friend of ours said, "No, everyone in this room just wishes that we had your childhood case." <laughs> I'm starting to think so too. All right. <laughs> now, obviously, you, you research extensively for your novels. Mm -hmm. Where where has your research taken you? Tell us all about that. Well, um, I it, it is true that uh, many of my books are very research intensive, but I love to research. I think it's just reading with a purpose. Um, and when I'm researching a book, I become deeply immersed in the research um to the point that I find it hard to read anything else. At the moment, I am I am working on a book. It's a retelling of Beauty and the Beast set in Nazi Germany. And so I'm deeply immersed in books. I have sitting on my desk right now, I have a book called Hitler's Secret Life, another one called The German Underground, another one called On the Road to the Wolf's Lair, and another one called uh, Women Heroes of World War Two. So that's what I've been reading lately. So that's just reading for this afternoon, basically, for you then? Yeah, that's yes. it. <laughs> yep. I, I meant to ask you too, sorry, your two Silky Tales from Scotland, where and when is the launch and is it open to the public? Yes, it's open to the uh, public. We're having two launches. One is in um, Armadale and I believe it's next Saturday. Ooh. Yes, looking at my diary open on my desk. So I'm flying up to Armadale with my daughter and um, we're having the launch at 4pm on Saturday um, at Fiona McDonald's shop, and all the details are on the website or on my, you know, on my Facebook page. Right. And then we are having the Sydney launch on Wednesday, the twenty-first of May, which.
which um, and we're having that at Birklow Bookshop in Balgaula, which mm-hmm. is the local bookshop for both me and my sister. I'm sharing that launch with my sister. I've got two books coming out, and Brenda's got three oh. on the same in the same month. Oh, and so you're launching them both, or you're launching all of them at the same time? Yes. We know. We thought, let's just have one big party. Oh, fabulous. So my books are Two Selkie Tales from Scotland, yes. which is a children's, beautiful, illustrated children's book. And then I have an adult book called Dancing on Knives, Ooh. which is actually um, the, the republication of the book that I wrote for my master's degree. Right. That was published as Kate Humphrey. Okay. And my sister's got three children's books. She has. I know she's got a lot of books coming out this year and we're going to chat more about that when she's on the show. Excellent. Okay, thanks for tuning in to The Author Shelf this afternoon. I'm joined today by internationally acclaimed author Kate Forsyth. Kate will be appearing at this year's Sydney's Writers' Festival on a number of panels. One includes the Naked Bookshelf panel between 10 and 11 on the 22nd of May. Kate, do I dare ask the Naked panel? Well, luckily, I don't have to turn up naked Thank myself. Okay. <laughs> um, it's going to be a really interesting panel, actually. It's um, it's actually a discussion about um, our bookshelves. Um, I'm a bibliomaniac. I have more than 6,000 books, and I'm a collector. Um, my my particular passion is uh, old old children's books. And so I have in my collection, I have, for example, I have a signed Inner Blyton, I have a signed Patricia Wrightson, I have a first edition C.S. Lewis, um, I have signed books from Molly Hunter, Susan Cooper, Ursula Le, Le Guin, uh, Mary Hoffman. Um, I just have this passion for old books and old artifacts. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'll be talking about. Um, the other... Our panellists include um, someone who's Skyping in from New York. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Very, very sounds excellent. Sounds like lots of fun. I'm still stuck on 6,000 books, Kate. I know. We had to move so that I could have a library. So you're you're a fairy tale in itself. Your house must be built from books instead of like (laughs) Hansel and Gretel and, you know, the the witch's house built out of candy and things. Yours is actually built out of books. It sometimes appears that way. I mean, I think we have books in every single room. Um, (laughs) (laughs) And holding up the furniture and And the walls. And holding up the furniture, that's right. And I can just, you know, I can just put my teacup down on a tottering pile of of books. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I um, I find... I do have an agreement with my husband mm. that if I really dislike a book, I can I have to give it away or um, or donate it, it to charity. I'm only allowed to keep books that I love. Okay, but I'm thinking six thousand books that hasn't happened yet. No, no that's okay. right because I do love and I, I do read an awful lot. Like um, I guess I would probably read four or five books a week. Okay, so you're not breaking the agreement then because you just haven't found any that you don't like. I occasionally do, but I'm not going to announce what they oh, are. Oh, no, of course not. Because I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. That would be the old, you know, that would be actually the old magazines that, you know, are sitting there from 25 <laughs> years ago. Okay, all right, Kate, what's the best writing tip that you've been given? Um, I think the best writing tip I was ever given was when I was at school um, and desperately wanting to be a writer but my parents were worried that that wasn't a very practical life choice and they wanted me to go to university and study something practical and we were fighting quite a lot about it my English teacher said to me you know she said Kate I think if you want to be a writer the best thing that you can do is write is read the works of other great writers and so I you know, and, and she said, take this opportunity, go to university and study and read. And so I did. I was able to, to make my parents happy and take on that advice. And I actually think it's the best advice ever. Um, it really upsets me when I hear writers say, oh, I, I never read. And mm. it's just like a stab to my heart. Like I stare at them, gobsmacked. Really? How can you possibly write if you don't love reading. And so that's always my advice. Read as widely and as deeply and with as much variety as possible. Don't get stuck just reading one genre or one style of book. Read everything. Perhaps you should lock them in your house for a while. (laughs) They wouldn't have a choice then, would they? I don't need... I don't need to lock them in. I just have to abandon them in the middle of my house and I'll never find their way out. And stack the books up at the front door exactly. so they can't get out. Oh, look, we've only got a few minutes left, Kate, and I've got so many more questions for you. Kate, what's what's next from you? Apart from your book launches, what, what are you working on well, at the moment? Well, um, 
I have later in the year, I have, I just finished this amazing um, project with, with Scholastic. It's called The Impossible Quest, and it's a five-book fantasy adventure series for readers about nine or ten plus. Maybe your Charlotte might like them. Maybe. Um, and it's a, a transmedia project, so we're having websites and games and iPod apps and all sorts of exciting things. Mm. And the idea is is that um, hidden within each book are a series of clues, um, you know, answers to riddles and, and other, uh, you know, codes and, and puzzles. And the children, the only way that they get to access all the cool stuff on the website and in the apps is to have the codes. And the only way to get the codes is to read the books. Mm. I think Charlotte might have to fight me for that. Ah, they and they were so much fun to write. I just had an absolute ball writing them. Um, book one, which is called Escape from Wolfhaven Castle, comes out in September. And the second book, which is called Wolves of the Witchwood, that comes out in November. And then each book comes out about three months later. So books three, four, uh, five come out early next year. So that's been a massive project because not only have I, did I have to write the books, but I've also be, had to write all the content for all the games and the website. Wow. Um, and so it's been a really, really big job. It sounds like it's a huge job. Yeah. Well, okay, so that, sound, that just sounds really exciting. And then I'm working on the retelling of Beauty and the Beast of set in, in Nazi Germany. And so I'm, I'm still in the early stages of that, but I'm, I'm absolutely obsessed and gripped with fever by it, which is always a good sign for me when I'm, you know, when I, I, I can't go to bed because I'm, my, my mind is just, you know, electric just with ideas. Exactly, exactly. Fa- fascinating. Thank you. You're such a, oh, you, I can hear the passion in your voice, Kate. It's it's absolutely wonderful. Oh, well, thank you. Now, are you an emerging author or illustrator? Are you serious about taking that next step and perhaps being as successful as Kate Forsyth? Why not visit creativekidstowers.com.au? There you can have a full author and illustrator profile, including displaying your work, networking with others. You'll also find useful tools such as comprehensive publishers listing, writing tips, competition information, author interviews, book reviews, and loads more. Visit the Creative Kids Tales website today. What are you waiting for? Creativekidstales.com.au. Don't forget this week's giveaway for your chance to win a copy of Kate's book, Bitter Greens. Pop over to our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash the author's shelf, and tell us why you'd like to win a copy of Kate's book. We'll pick a winner and announce them on our next show. Kate, thank you very much for joining me on today's show. Thank you so much for having me. I think we could have talked for another three hours, we Georgie. We could have, couldn't I've we? I've had such a gorgeous time. Oh, thank you so much. Now, to find out more about this wonderful, wonderful lady, please visit her website, kateforsyth.com.au. Her surname is spelt F-O-R-S-Y. T H and that's dot com dot au. Well, that's all about for that's all for this edition of the Author's Shelf. Thank you very much for joining us. Author Ga- Gabrielle.